Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the cardiac action potential. Okay, right, so the point we've got to at the moment is this plateau phase of the action potential where no one is winning, basically. You've got L-type voltage-gated calcium channels opening, and they're allowing calcium to move in, so positive charge to move in. But at the same time, we're opening these delayed rectifier potassium channels, which are allowing potassium to move out, and that's positive charge moving out. So basically, these two balance each other, and so you don't get any change in electrical potential difference across the membrane. So it sticks at zero, and this is the plateau phase of the action potential. Now, I want to now discuss these delayed rectifier potassium channels. What are they? What types are they? Okay, so we've discussed voltage-gated potassium channels, thankfully, so this shouldn't take too long. Right, so the delayed rectifiers then, which actual types of potassium channels are they? Right, so there are three delayed rectifiers that I'm going to talk about. There are probably far more than that if you actually go and research it. But I'm going to talk to you about the main three that I know. The ones that are famous because if you knock them out, generally you get long QT syndrome. Okay, so the first two are easy and then the last one is a bit more difficult. So I'm going to do the first two first because they're le because I'm feeling lazy. So the first one then, KV 11.1. So this is a gene which is in the 11th family of voltage-gated potassium channel alpha subunits, and it's a homotetramer, so nice and easy. You just take this gene, you use it four times to make four proteins, and you stick those four identical alpha subunits together to make a pore-forming unit of your voltage-gated potassium channel here. Okay? Similarly, we have another homotetramer, which is KV uh, 1.5. So that's even nicer because it's in this first family. How lovely. So KV 1.5, and again, it's a homotetramer. So you uh, use this gene, make the protein four times, take these four proteins, stick them together, tetramize them together, and you've got your pore forming unit of this voltage-gated potassium channel. And these are delayed rectifiers, okay? Now, one that's going to be slightly more difficult and take a little bit more effort is it is a KV7.1 homotetramer. However, KV7.1 has a bunch of other names which confuses people and also it associates uh, with another subunit that's important to discuss. So, KV7.1, it's an alpha subunit in the KV7 family we're going to make it four times, and we're going to tetramize them all together. However, you're also going to make another protein, okay? And you're going to bind this to each one of these alpha subunits in order to actually make the voltage-gated potassium channel. And this protein that you're going to bind to it is a single membrane-spanning protein. So I'll span the membrane once, and this protein is known as KCNE. One, Okay, so here is the KCNE1 protein, and what you can do is you can take this protein, it can associate with just one of these alpha subunits. So, you take an alpha subunit, you take a KCNE1 subunit, you bind them together, and that will make one quarter of uh, the channel now. And then you take four of those, you take four alpha subunits with this KCNE1 also associated with it, and those will now tetramize together to make this KV7.1 uh, homotetramer. Okay, now KV7.1 also has a bunch of other names. It's also referred to as uh, KVLQT1. So you'll also hear this referred to as KVLQT1, okay? And that LQT is for long QT. So if you knock this gene out, you get long QT syndrome, which is why that LQT is there. In addition, it's also often referred to... Oh, whoops, not like that. It's also often referred to as the KCNQ1. KCNQ1. 
okay? Um, so all of these names, they all mean the same gene that's coding for the same protein. So KVLQT1, KV7.1, KCNQ1, they're all referring to this same alpha subunit, which then associates with a KCNE1 uh, subunit before then forming this tetramer and making a, a KV7.1 homotetramer. Now, all of these homotetramers are delayed rectifier potassium channels now. Okay, so now let's discuss the finale of this all. Okay, right. So, at the moment, what has happened is these two types of channels, these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels and these delayed rectifier potassium channels, so these KV7.1 homotetramers, KV11.1 homotetramers and KV1.5 homotetramers, they are both taking a long time to open after being activated to open. So make no mistake, they were activated to open in phase zero. They're just extremely slow about doing it. So they only start to open at around this sort of phase here. Now, at the moment, the conductance of calcium in through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels is matching the conductance of potassium out through these uh, delayed rectifier potassium channels. Okay, so it's stalemate, basically, and you're going nowhere. However, which one is going to give in first? Basically, it's the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. The L-type voltage-gated calcium channel will be open for a while, and then it will close, whereas these will cling on for ages, basically. So this starts to close, and then these remain open, basically. So what does that mean? You're reducing the flow of calcium in, and the flow of potassium has remained the same, basically. So, in fact, actually, if anything, it gets bigger towards the end. Okay, so as we approach the end of this plateau phase, what's going to happen is the conductance of calcium in is going to go down. So these are going to start shutting. These are actually, if anything, going to start conducting more. And so you're going to get increased movement of potassium out, decreased movement of calcium in. So overall, you're now going to be moving positive charge out. And if you move positive charge out, it reduces the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment, raises the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. So this goes down, this goes up, this becomes more negative, and you're going to repolarize the electrical potential difference across the membrane. So you get the repolarization phase like this, and that's when these delayed rectified potassium channels are winning. And this is known as phase three of the cardiac action potential. And then what happens is you get back down to where you started. You get back down to negative 85 millivolts. And you can't go much beyond that. Why? Because that's the Nernst potential for potassium. Well, nearly there, basically. So you can't go much beyond that. Um, so even if these channels remain open, it's not going to do anything because the movement of... Uh, because the um, gradient in potassium across this membrane will be balanced by the electrical gradient, i.e. the concentration gradient is favouring the movement of potassium out, because this is 105, 55 millimolar inside, and it's 4 millimolar outside. But if we're at a negative 85 electrical potential difference across this membrane, that means the intracellular compartment is at a lower electrical potential by 85 millivolts, okay? Potassium is a positive ion, so it wants to remain, therefore, in this lower electrical potential compartment. And at that point, what will happen is these two, um, these two um, counter forces will basically um, meet to get to a stalemate, basically. The push of the potassium out by the concentration gradient will be balanced by the uh, push of the potassium back in, by the... Um, electrical gradient. So you get to electrical chem electrochemical equilibrium. So even if these remain open, it doesn't matter. You're not going to go anywhere beyond negative 85 millivolts. And then you're back where you started. And eventually what will happen is these delayed rectifier potassium channels will close. It will go back completely to equilibrium and you can conduct another action potential. So that then is the cardiac action potential. I just want to um, say one little thing about saltatory conduction. So, 
this will be happening basically at a tiny little bit of membrane of this cardiomyocyte. I know I've spread it out over the entire membrane, but that was just for the picture. This will have happened at a tiny little bit here, okay? All of that will have happened in that tiny little bit, okay? So, how does the action potential spread along the membrane of the cardiomyocyte? Well, if it happens here, in the upstroke of the cardiac action potential, in phase zero, you're bringing in a load of sodium ions into the cell. So you're going to have a load of sodium ions underneath here, and those will diffuse over to the neighboring bit and cause depolarization of the membrane there, and they'll kickstart the action potential there. And then you'll have the same thing happening at this neighboring bit here. It will then spread, it will then allow sodium ions to come in there, which will spread the action potential on further. So you'll get this spreading of the action potential where an action potential at one point of the membrane induces an action potential in the neighboring portion of the membrane, etc. And that is what's known as saltatory conduction. The fancy name for that. Um, idea of one piece of membrane undergoing an action potential inducing its neighbors to undergo action potentials, etc., etc. That's known as saltatory conduction. Okay, and what will happen is this will spread over to the other side and then it will cause action potentials in its neighbor. So, neighbors, so this, it will be connected by gap junctions to its neighbors and this process will continue on basically and it will spread along uh, the myocardial cells.